Uh, this class is being recorded, so if you do not want to be seen and you don't want to be heard, uh, you can make your settings so that that can happen. Um, do turn off your video feeds anyway, just so that because the video is being recorded, we don't want the file to be too large. Um, go ahead and start recording. We have started. Hello, my name is the Honorable Lord Ian the Green uh, in the SCA. Uh, outside the SCA, I'm simply known as David. Uh, most of my friends actually outside the SCA also call me by my middle name, Ian. Um, I, contrary to what the PDF says um, when I made this, uh, I've been actually been instructing now in calligraphy for about 15, six, doing calligraphy for about 15 or 16 years. Uh, and I, this was actually one of the first classes I taught. Uh, and so it says, I've been doing calligraphy for, for three years. I forget exactly what it says. Um, so yeah, I've been instructing for now in uh, about 14 years. I'm a little bit better than I was when I got started. At least I hope I am. Um, when I teach this class, in person, I have uh, sheets of paper, uh, samples of paper to hand out. I show calligraphy pens and things like that. Um, obviously, we can't do that that we're in, um, but I do hope that some of you brought your calligraphy pens with you because we are eventually going to get to the point where we're going to write. Uh, but the first part of the class is really about getting information to you so that you can have an easier time as a beginner, uh, as a scribe, as a calligrapher. Um, so yeah, we'll be, so to go through the format, uh, we, the quick overview for the course really is we're going to be exploring the tools and the basics of calligraphy today. Uh, we're going to be looking at what goes into doing calligraphy. We're going to break it down and learning how the different pieces come together. Uh, and that way, um, I find it easier if you understand the different pieces and parts for you to put them together. Uh, when I was uh, in eighth grade, my social studies teacher said all big problems are just small problems that you, that, you know, solve the small problems and the big ones go away. And uh, that, that philosophy seems to really work well, at least for me, when I was doing um, We're going to start in broad terms, and then we get more narrow and get things defined. Uh, inside, if you're looking at the handout as we go through it, uh, if, it if it's a new term, we're going to put it in bold, uh, and then we're going to have a def definition behind it. If you're not following behind, if you're not following on the paper, don't worry, I'll still be doing that. I just wanted to let you know what the big plan here is. All right, to start with, like we said, calligraphy uh, is just like any other hobby. We do have those new terms and languages. Um, calligraphy itself comes from Greek and it literally means pretty writing. Um, there's another interpretation um, and I did not write that down and I don't remember it off the top of my head, but pretty or beautiful writing. Um, calligraphy is not handwriting. I want to get rid of that myth right away. With handwriting, we move our fingers. And that's how we write. With calligraphy, we lock our fingers, we lock our wrist, and we pull with our elbow and our shoulder. And so we're actually pulling. It's a lot like painting would be for most for, for if you've been taught how to paint. Uh, and so calligraphy is not handwriting. It uses a different part of our brain. Handwriting is a uh, fine motor skill. Uh, and people that have uh, tremors or connective tissue disorders or things like that often have a hard time with handwriting because it is a fine motor skill. But because calligraphy is switched over from that fine motor skill to a gross motor skill, it changes the brain pathway and it changes the nerve pathway a little. And so it changes how your body responds. And they find that it's easier to do calligraphy than it is to do handwriting. Uh, that's not a guarantee, but it is the tendency. Um, I lied in this. I need to get this corrected. Wow. Um, I said we use hand to differentiate between different kinds of calligraphy. We actually use the word to, you to, to differentiate. Your version of a script is your hand of that calligraphy. So the script is that perfect form of the calligraphy, that ideal. And then you write it and I write it. It's not going to look the same. So you have your hand of that script and I have my hand of that script. Um, I can do several different scripts of calligraphy. Um, for example, I can do Uncial, I can do Irish Uncial, also known as Insular Majuscule, Carolingian Majuscule, Gothic, uh, Gothic Latura Bastarda. There's a lot of different names that are out there, but the idea is each and every one of those is a separate script of calligraphy. Now, you probably just heard me use the term minuscule. Minuscule uh, 
there are two broad categories for scripts of calligraphy. There's majuscule and there's minuscule. Uh, the minuscule hand, those minuscule scripts has capitals and non-capitals. And whereas the majuscule script pretty much only has what you might call capitals. Uh, when we actually start the first calligraphy script that we're gonna work with is going to be Unchul, and that is a majuscule script. I like to start off with that because then you pretty much only need to think about one way of doing the, uh, the, the letters. Okay, so moving on to tools for the calligrapher. Um, there are, most of the tools in the calligrapher are gonna deal with the pen, the paper, and the ink. Um, you can do calligraphy on your paper. Um, and it doesn't, and I'm not talking about parchment. You can do it on wood, you can do it on windows. Uh, we see, do it on plastic and all that kind of stuff. Our purpose is we're gonna just say paper as the, as the writing substrate, or the writing support, or the writing surface. Um, and it just keeps it easy because mostly that's what people will be writing on. Um, some of you have already gotten your calligraphy sets. You'll notice here is a, is a picture of the speedball that these are C nibs, um, and the C nibs for uh, speedball are the, the broad tip flat nibs. Um, the, as you can see, they come separately. You have a stick that you can use, in this case, you know, um, and you have a pen. And there's a, I don't know if you can see it in the, there it is, yay. Uh, you can a little bit see there's a spring. On the outside of that spring, and there's the wall, and you just want to insert the nib like that. So it goes, oop, get my finger out of the way. So you can see that it goes around the outside of it. And we'll actually cover this a little bit more in depth later, but I just wanted to go ahead and show it to you now. Um, pen holders are not all equal. This is actually a double-sided pen holder. So I can actually put a pen in each end. This is the pen that it's hard to see, sorry. Maybe if I switch over to the other camera, I can show you better. And that's gonna switch over a little bit better. And so, and this is called the cigar shaped one. Um, you can, you'll find what works for you. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you that they're all equal because for some people they are not. Um, there are also different kinds of nibs, as you can see down here in the pictures. We have a speedball nib. Um, there are Mitchell nibs that have detached reservoirs. There's the other ones that are there. Uh, these days, the Hero Tape nibs are available. The, they're not Hero anymore. I forget who's making them, but it looks a lot like what, what might be called a Browsy nib. And these are not going to show up too terribly well, unfortunately. Um, but I can certainly get pictures and we'll get pictures of these for everybody to see. Um, the thing about dip pens is that the ink has to get off the pen and onto the paper. So how does that work? If you happen to have your nibs, please go ahead and uh, take one out and flip it over so you're actually kind of looking at the underside of it. And I'm going to switch my, my camera again. on that light. Let's see if I can get it to focus correctly. There we go. Nice and in focus. So this is the bottom of the nib. Here we have the top. It says tape on it. So the ink collects in here. This is a curved surface and it works really well with the surface tension of the ink. It'll hold itself in there pretty well. That just is a nice little reserve to, uh, and it adds a little bit more. We have a vent here. That vent is actually what allows that ink to flow well uh, and better. Here down below the vent and then is, you can see the tip, but between the vent and the tip, 
there's a little crack in your pen. That crack um, is called many things. I call it a capillary uh, because it works pretty much like your capillaries do. It draws ink from up here or from above in the, <clears throat> sorry, in the reservoir, and it draws it down to under the tip, not to the tip, but actually under it. And when we put it, and, and that way, when we're writing lightly and correctly, the ink will actually conform to the shape of the tip, as opposed to get pushed around the outside. And when it conforms to the shape of the tip, you get crisper, cleaner calligraphy. So uh, it's important to clean your, your nibs correctly so the capillary does not get uh, blocked up. Um, and it's important not to push down on the tip, uh, which is the opposite of what we all do with when we write with a ballpoint pen. With a ballpoint pen, we need to push that ball up to get the ink to go down and around it. With this, we want to act like we're pulling the ink out of the paper and with a very light touch, be moving it. We don't want to push. Um, you'll break your nib, you will bend them. Um, it will not look good. You will scratch up uh, fibers from your paper. Um, a light touch, acting like you're drawing the ink out of the paper is actually one of the best ways to do calligraphy with a broad tip pen. Any questions from anyone so far? No questions are listed in chat. All right. If we're going to talk about the pen, eventually we're going to also have to talk about what you write on. And not all paper is created equal. Uh, I once told the new calligrapher, well, you don't have to become an expert on paper, but you're going to be whether you want to or not. Um, and it's just simple as it's, it's one of the things that calligraphers work with so much that you just kind of become this semi-expert on it on accident. Um, yeah, my Laura looked at me funny when I said that. So for completed work, um, for uh, depending on what you're in, a lot of kingdoms will do original scroll artwork. Um, and so uh, for those kingdoms, and I have people from all sorts of different places, some uh, non-SCA, some SCA, whatever it is, um, I generally recommend Bristol vellum. It's a, it, Bristol is a type of paper, vellum is the finish. Uh, the finish of a paper can be smooth, vellum, matte. There's all sorts of different finishes for, for paper. Um, Yeah, basically, like I say in here, in a kind of a lame way, is, is you know, finish is a term that's basically that we use like for wood or for paint. That's how the surface of the paper is, well, finished. So, so there are different kinds of paper out there besides the Bristol vellum that I recommend. You can get a pad of Bristol vellum these days for around $12 to $15 for 20 sheets. If you just want to practice, printer paper is fine. Um, I recommend, you know, 24 pound, I recommend bright, I recommend, you know, all sorts of other things, but any printer paper will work. Um, I do recommend you stay away from um, recycled, and I, I hate to say that, I like the use of recycled paper, but it doesn't work well for trying to do calligraphy practice on. Um, sometimes we have smooth, sometimes we have shiny, sometimes we have dull. Um, then we also have something called the tooth. And every piece, every kind of paper has a tooth and it's basically how rough or smooth the surface of the paper is. Um, some people say how fuzzy it is as opposed to how rough it is. Um, and it becomes more of a term of art than a specific definition at that point. Although I'm pretty sure that there's really specific definitions out there for it. Uh, but for the purposes of this class, uh, we're not going to worry about the, that terribly specific definition. Um, other papers that I recommend, Arches Hot Press, or any hot press paper you can get a hold of, Arches Cold Press. Arches Cold Press has two sides. It has a smooth side and it has a, a nice rough side. If you like to paint, the rough side is what you want. If you like calligraphy, you want the smooth side. Um, 
writing with a broad tip pen on a rough surface is a pain. So I only recommend Arches Told Press on the, on the smooth side for calligraphy. Um, and the smooth side does do painting very well, just painters like the rough side better for them. Um, there is Bristol Smooth, which is very much like Bristol Vellum. I just have a tendency to prefer, to prefer the Bristol Vellum. My preferences, by the way, are not a requirement for you. Um, not everybody's going to agree with me, but you know, I want you to look for these uh, when you're out uh, at a hobby store or at an art supply store. Go over and feel them and test them. Um, all of these are going to have a different way that the fiber uh, is put together and the way the fiber is finished. And if you can see the fiber, people are like, oh, no, you can't use that. Well, maybe you can. Um, how the paper accepts your ink is going to... Ian, we have a question. All right, ahead. Are some papers better for preventing bleeding? Same side or different side? That's exactly where I was headed. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yep, and that's exactly where I was headed when I started talking about the fiber. How the fiber comes together in the paper really changes how that paper accepts the ink. Um, paper with fiber you can see can often cause that spidery uh, that we were that the question was asked about. Um, if you can see the fiber but it's smooth, chances are it won't cause the spidery. Chances. Don't spend a lot of money. Get a test piece. Find out. Um, typically, when you can't see the fiber, you're going to do just fine. However. Um, here's a quick question for you to, to mull over, and I'll give you the answer. Um, how does a calligrapher erase their mistakes? Can't use an eraser. We use a sharp implement, and we scrape it off. And eventually, I will teach that, um, but not today. And so after you scrape that paper and you get off that mistake that you've made, you've gotten into the fiber of the pen. You've broken through the finish of the paper. You're into the fiber, and if you try and write on it, chances are good it's just going to spider out. So we use a burnisher, then we pounce it, and, and then we pray to whatever gods or maybe our, our, our patron demon of calligraphy uh, of scribes to help us, and then we draw on it, and we hope it doesn't spider. Most of the time, we get away with it. Uh, by the way, if you haven't read it and you have uh, Drogan's book, read chapter three, Scribes have a patron demon of calligraphy, a patron demon of scribes. Not a patron saint, a patron demon. His name is Tetivalus. Does that answer the question? Or are we looking for specific paper recommendations? Besides the paper recommendations that I gave, um, I really don't have many others. Um, you'll notice that this class is European centered. Uh, it is not uh, Arabic or uh, various Asian country specifics. Um, I actually have very little knowledge in that area. And so I'm keeping it very Europe centric. And I, I kind of apologize for that. But there's also only so much that can be taught at a time too. So uh, paper recommendations, like I said, for projects, for scrolls and finished projects, Arches Hot Press, Arches Cold Press, uh, Bristol Vellum, Bristol Smooth. Um, they, many of these will come uh, with, in pre-cut pads. Um, sometimes you need to buy a two foot by three foot sheet of paper, and then you can cut it to whatever you want it to be. Um, outside of paper, there are other writing surfaces that you can write on. Uh, one of the most Famous, of course, is going to be parchment or vellum. Um, and in this case, we're talking about actual animal skin. I do make it, so if you have questions about, about that process, I can talk about that another time. Um, and essentially, it is animal skin that has been dehaired, defatted, scraped, stretched, sanded down, made thin, made smooth. Uh, and it is a real joy to write on. Um, and that is what uh, a lot of uh, books were made out of between 500 and 1500. 
contrary to popular belief, yes, paper did make it into Europe before 1500. Uh, it just became really popular after the plague. Uh, the reason for that, that paper became popular after the plague is, well, paper is made from linen rag, and well, there's a lot more fabric around than there were people at the time for some reason. Um, and nobody else would take clothing from somebody who'd had the plague, but the rag man couldn't tell the difference, so they sold it there. Uh, and that's how the paper industry in Europe uh, really began to be. Um, parchment's expensive. $75 a square foot for manuscript quality vellum is not, um, an, outreas uh, not an outrageous price. Um, $50 for um, vellum that's really only really, really smooth on one side, not an outrageous price. Um, so it's very expensive. Um, pergamonata is something of a vellum or parchment substitute. It is made from animals, not animals, I apologize. It is made from plants. Um, it is very smooth. In many ways, it does mimic parchment. You can get it in bright white. You can get it in what they call natural. Um, interestingly enough, white is natural. Um, so, and it is very fun to write on. Um, it is not particularly easy to paint on. And so that takes a little bit of time getting used to it. Uh, it's not just like grab a piece of paper and you start painting because um, pergamonata likes moisture. And so it starts to buckle when you paint on it. Um, but it is really pretty to write on. Um, and so I do recommend uh, if you can get a sample of that sometime, give it a try. I think you'll like it. Um, it's very easy to, to fix your mistakes. Um, it feels a little slippery at first, but then again, so does parchment. Uh, it's just a different feel than paper. Um, and it's very cheap. You can get about uh, a typical 11 by 14 pack for 10. Well, that used to be about 10, $15. I haven't bought one in a while, so I don't want to give you the exact price. Janiel Bookseller is an easy place to, to, to find the price for that. Ink. I can talk your ear off about ink. Um, I've been making ink almost as long as I've been a calligrapher. Um, so we have different terms for ink. Um, and I want to remind everybody, you do not need to use black ink to, for your practices. I started writing in a blue ink. If you want to write in green or purple or whatever, feel free. This is your practice. Write with the color of ink that's going to make you happy that you can get a hold of. Um, so inks that fade are called fugitive. There's different reasons why they fade. Some inks just fade. Doesn't matter what you do to them, eventually it's just going to fade. Fugitive as in runs away. Um, inks that don't fade or fade sl more slowly are called color fast. Inks that don't lose color normally, but will lose color when they're exposed to light are not light fast. Inks that will not lose their color are called light fast. So color fast and light fast are two different things. Um, if something is color fast, it is not always light fast. Uh, if something is light fast, it's not always going to become color fast. Uh, light fast is just a measurement of does it fade or does it not when it's exposed to light. Uh, it may not fade just because it's exposed to light, but it could still fade because it's not a light, it's not a color fast ink to begin with. If you're confused, that's okay. The simple way to think about this is if I shine a flashlight on it forever and it fades, it's not light fast. If I close the book and it fades, it's not color fast. That's the easy way to explain it. Um, there are a bunch of commercial links that are out there. Um, they are not all made equal. Uh, you can find Speedwell and Higgin inks used to the time, most of the time. Uh, Higgins black is okay. Higgins eternal black is much better. Um, of course, I don't have any hand. I just got my, my uh, there's Windsor Newton. There's PH Martin. Um, there's a bunch of different, there's, there's calligraphy as in, yes, that's the name of the brand of ink, calligraphy. Um, basically, uh, pigmented inks, and they'll say pigmented on them, um, that you can 
kind of find the light fastness, kind of find the color fastness. Those radians are not universal, but they will tell you on the, on the side. Basically, you want to get a pigmented ink that says it'll work for dip pens uh, or for calligraphy pens, and you'll be just fine. Uh, any of them will work. Any questions so far? No questions so far. All right. So one of the things, uh, by the way, you can usually get ink for about $5 oh, sorry, or we less. Do, we do have a question, sorry. Question is, is India ink a pigment, pigment ink? ink. <laughs> Who's laughing? Because you're right. Um, India That's ink. Richard. Okay. Technically, India ink is a carbon black ink that comes from China originally. Now, the problem becomes there are so many things out there on the market nowadays that are called India ink, that there's no simple way to answer that question. Or the simple answer doesn't help. The simple answer to is India ink a pigment ink is maybe. Um, it should be fine. Um, Pelican Black, um, you'll see, or Pelican. It, I don't know if they still make that one. Um, they're fine. They're a good. They're a good pigment ink. Um, there are India inks out there that um, you have a varnish. Don't use those. They will clog up your pen. Um, there are India inks out there that are acrylic. Don't use those. They'll clog up your pen. There are people out there that will tell you, "Oh no, acrylic inks are fine." And you know what? It is for them, and it might even be for you. Um, but my recommendation is. Don't use acrylic and don't use uh, varnish. Add varnish inks. They were they made these gorgeous gemstone colors. And after about 15 minutes of writing with them, I had to clean the pen with vodka because vodka was the only thing that would clean off the varnish that you know, didn't also eat my metal of my pen. So um, yeah, try to stay to water base as well. Try and stay away from acrylic and definitely stay away from the varnish base. Um, so the answer with India ink is maybe it depends on which kind you got, but generally, okay. um, any other questions about ink? No other questions. All right. Uh, and if there's a question that's popped up about something else that you, you thought of in the meantime, you're welcome to answer those. I have no problem going back. So one of the things that scares people about calligraphy is one, that it's handwriting. Okay, we covered that, that it's not. And two, that it seems to be very detail-oriented. And I'm just not a detail-oriented person. I don't think I can really do calligraphy. I have ADHD. I have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I, I do pretty decent calligraphy, I am told. Um, the attention to detail is not as difficult or tedious as you might think it is. I'm not gonna tell you it's not, a, I'm gonna tell you it's easy, um, but I'm also gonna tell you that it's not impossible and it's not hard. If somebody, you know, and I'm not the only scribe, calligraphy scribe that I know of that has ADHD and has no problem with doing calligraphy. So I just, I'm saying that not as a, well, if I can do it, you can do it. No, I'm saying it as, the, that there are people out there that really have, you know, attention span issues because that's the way our brains are wired that can do this. So I'm trying to give you hope that it shouldn't be impossible for you either. Give it a try. If it works for you, great. And if it doesn't, nobody's going to be offended by that. Um, and if you're doing it through the class with, with Green Man Calligraphy Group, we'll work with you. We'll try and find ways to make it work. So don't worry about that attention to detail, we're going to show you how to play with it and have fun with it. That's the goal anyway. Um, so I have to do a lot of practice on calligraphy to get it right and to do it right. 15 minutes a day. If you are a new scribe, please don't do calligraphy for more than 15 minutes a day. At 15 minutes, stop. Put your pen down. 15 minutes a day is all you should be doing as a beginning scribe. 
And there's several reasons for that. Uh, and one of them is stamina. Well, I have a good stamina. You might, that's fine. But your hand, your arm, your elbow, your shoulder might not. And so people always say, you know, practice makes perfect. That's not true. Perfect practice makes perfect. We do what we practice. And if we practice fatigued and making mistakes, then our calligraphy is fatigued and making mistakes. And the more we practice fatigue, the more mistakes we make and the less good our calligraphy becomes. 15 minutes a day keeps the way and it keeps the, and it keeps the practice short. And we're still getting those brain pathways made so that the movements become second nature. You'll get there 15 minutes a day, eight weeks later, I came in second place in a contest at an SCA event. Um, the person who came in first was a Laurel. Uh, the person who came in second was me. And the person who came in third was somebody who had been doing calligraphy for three years, two years. It's not because I'm some fantastic and wonderful prodigy, no. It's because I practiced 15 minutes a day and I got into consistency. And the other person wasn't as consistent. Um, they're a good calligrapher. And I think they're a laurel by now, if I remember right. Um, but at the time, they'd only been doing it for two years. Practice 15 minutes a day. The point is, it works. You'll be fine. Any suggestions at this point? We're clear so far. So normally when I teach this class in person, this is where I say, okay, everybody get up, shake your body, move around, go potty. So if people are willing to do that right now, um, I would actually like to take a five minute break to let people get up and stretch and move because we're actually gonna start doing calligraphy and we've been sitting for quite a while. Our bodies have kind of gotten settled and I'd like people to get up and move a little bit. So we can pause the recording hopefully and then come be acidic. Um, I make Iron Girl Ink, I've made it at two, I've, I've tested the pH of it at 2.7. I've tested it at 5.5. 5.5 is less acidic than the rainwater. Um, the problem is not with the ink in and of itself, but it's about the interaction between the, the, what it is on and the environment that it is in. Because when iron gold ink is dry, it's not going to act like an acid. So um, a lot of people will also tell you, oh, iron gold ink will eat your nibs. Water will eat your nibs. Um, you gotta dry off your pen, you gotta clean it. Just do that and your pens will uh, be well-maintained. You'll be fine. So um, iron gold ink is a synthetic pigmented ink. So we are once again recording because I wanted to record that answer that you just gave. Ah. Um, so I'll ask everybody again to stop their video. And we have one more question that is, will, will we be working with left-handed teachers? There are people that are ready to come in and help. And when I say come in, I don't mean here in this classroom, not in this video today, um, that are in the group. We, uh, we have about 12, 13 instructors at this point. We have another one who said they'll come in, but something's happened. We haven't seen them in a while. But um, about half of our instructors are there expressly to help uh, with the uh, with left-handed people. So uh, the answer is yes, left-handed instructors or people that are used to working with left-handed people and instructing left-handed people will be available in the group to, to, to discuss things. Does that answer the question? I believe it does. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully the other person can let us know and yes. make a follow-up clarifying question if it didn't. All right, so let's go back to this. All right, Ian, you're once again, you're still spotlighted, so we're ready to continue. All right. Um, I have set aside the, the, the handout, um, so I do not remember exactly what it says or, or what the next step is exactly supposed to be. Um, I do know what I'm going to teach, though. So... Um, calligraphy is made up of essentially four different strokes. Um, some people will tell you six, um, but broad tip calligraphy, which is what we're doing, uh, essentially has four strokes. Curve to the right. It has. A if you're drawing line, it, and it has it, a 
are you drawing anything? All I see is a white uh -huh. screen. Nope, I'm not drawing anything. Okay, all right. Um, and it, it has a horizontal line and it has a perpendicular line. Um, and that, and people, well, what about the diagonals? Well, those are kind of in the circles, in the curves. Um, so there's a lot of things that, By the way, we also draw a lot of lines as calligraphers. We're going to just get used to the idea that you're going to line your own paper eventually. Uh, not today. You can do the printouts. I hope that people got the ones that I gave. So the first stroke that I want people to try and, to try out, let me adjust this so that's flat. There we go. Um, is the first half of the circle. It's what I call the curve to the left. Now, before we do that, though, we have to learn how to dip our pen. Um, and so I have the Dappen dish. Some people had asked about that in the group. Now that's actually um, horizontal. Uh, so it's not actually like the, what you think you're seeing. But you want to take your pen and you want to dip it in halfway. Not all the way, don't cover it up, just halfway. From the side, right? And then if you do that, you can kind of see that there's this little drop of ink on the very tip. Well, if you try and write with that, it's going to blob. So take your pen, hold it against the side of your ink holder. Sometimes it's the ink bottle. And guess what? It's not there anymore. So to review, dip halfway, bring it back out, hold it to the side, and you don't have that blob anymore. Now, some people say, well, what about the back? Well, you want to do it in the back, you can. Some pens work that way, others don't. I do recommend the underside as opposed to the top side or back. Um, you notice though, if you hold it for too long, it drains your reservoir. There's nothing in there. So really, honestly, it doesn't need to be very long. Now I have a little bit of ink left in my reservoir. But I still have that little bit of a drop, and you got to check that. All right. Any questions about dipping your pen? Because really, honestly, this is the first place that, that causes most of the frustration. No questions so far. If you're using a cartridge. OK. If you're using a cartridge pen, well, just watch out for that blob, clean it off if you see it. Um, but generally speaking, cartridge pens don't have that kind of an issue. All right. So that curve to the left. I want to make it so you can actually see what I'm doing. Um, before we get to the curve to the left, we need to draw our ladder. And that ladder tells us how many nib widths we're at. The way we do that is we take our pen, we put it perpendicular to the, to the line. This line down here that we're writing on is called the baseline. And what we want to do is try and make a square. If you succeed in making a square the first time that you draw this, you'll be the first person I've ever met to be able to do that. It's not as easy as it sounds. It's not the most horrible thing. Just get, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to not be perfect. We're all beginners, or at least some of us are. Um, and if you are a beginner, we were all beginners at one point. So the next square, see how that one's not even perfect? Six. There we go. The hard part is getting that nib perfectly flat. If you do that, you get a little bit of a curve at the bottom. We want to avoid that if we can. It happens. All right. Then we want to make it kind of look like a step lap or steps. So we take the bottom of the nib and we put it at that corner. One, two, we're going to do to four. Three. Four. That is called four nib widths high. And the top of that 
if that's going to be your, your lettering, the top of your lettering, becomes what we call the waistline. As in, you know, the waist that you have as a human being. I drew that a little bit too high. There we go. Um, if you are not drawing it and you have a pre-done one, hopefully those four nib widths hit the top of your, your pre-printed line. If it didn't, just try and remember where that's at. Um, eventually you'll be able to do this because you've done it so many times. I remember the first time I started writing without drawing my ladder and then I stopped and I went, oh my God, I'm doing it wrong. And I did my ladder and I went, wait, I, I've got it. And I don't, I don't remember how many, I know it was like a year and a half, two years in, but I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, you'll get there is the point. Um, so the other thing we're going to talk about is pen angle. There's two pen we're going to worry about is the pen angle of the pen to the baseline. And so you can actually draw out that the symbol for a, for a right angle square, but basically it's just half of a square. You're not going to finish this off. And having this drawn out ahead of time is really useful and helpful. 30 to 45 degrees is what we're after. Pick one. I recommend 30. But you don't need to measure it out perfectly. You just need to have it there so that you can put your pen on it and stay consistent. So if I come over here and I draw a line, OK, that didn't look right. Here, let me put that there. See the difference between the two? That wasn't the correct pen angle. That was more the correct. So drawing this out, again, use your nib, put it flat, perpendicular, flat there, and then draw what you think is roughly 30. That one looks a little bit more like 45 to me for some reason. Stay consistent to that. And if you have to, before you actually put your pen down to write, put it here, test it, and then you can leave your fingers where they're at and reach your nib at the top and just kind of twist it to make it match. So if I have it here, well, that's not matching, is it? It's, it's not the same. So I twist it, and there it is. All right, I'm matching. And it takes a while to get comfortable with that. So please use that so you have consistency. All right. It looks like it's going to be closer to an hour for this. The curve to the left. Place that there. We start at the waistline. And we're going to make a curve. And we just I make a circle and pull it back and around and we stop about there. Things that are going to happen because you are new and it's okay. This is about learning how pen control works. Okay. You may go here, decide that you've gone too far, flatten it out and then curve. If you see that you flattened it out, realize that you, you psyched yourself out and that you just needed to keep it a little bit more round. No big deal. The idea here isn't to be perfect. The idea here is to see what you're doing so that you can change it to what we're looking for. That's all we're after here. We're not here to make fun of anybody. We're not here to feel bad about how I can't do this the first time. We're going to do this because it takes practice. And in the end, we know we're going to get something really beautiful. Now on this one, you may notice that I didn't touch the bottom. Okay, I'm off that baseline a little bit. This one I hit the baseline, this one I hit the baseline, this one I missed. Decide now if you always want to hit the baseline or if you always want to float slightly above it. Either is a valid choice, but you don't get, but if you switch back and forth between them, it's good that we're going to catch that. You're going to see that. You may not know what it is or why it is that you're seeing it, but you're going to look and go, that doesn't look right. So just be consistent. Touch the baseline or don't if you don't try and miss it the, the same way every time.
Now, in, in my in-person class, I have everybody draw about a line of these. And I come through while you're doing it. And I help you figure out what you're doing and how to correct it. Um, for left-handed people, let's see if I can do this. This doesn't work really, right? You can turn the net, you can turn your page. And then you're kind of hooking and you can draw it that way. Wait, wait, you didn't see that because I wasn't in camera. So you've turned it about 45 and then you can come up here and draw it. And you notice that's not very good. I'm not left-handed, so it's like I'm learning this for the first time. You see from that what's going on. One, I didn't have my pen nib down flat enough. Uh, two, I didn't, you know, all this other stuff. The idea is that we're trying to get to where we're going to be. Um, learning, yeah, I'll leave it there. Um, ask the questions in the in the main group, and the left-handed instructors can get a hold of you and work with you on stuff. Uh, unfortunately, we're we're limited with what, with what we have because of Zoom. Um, but yes, for everybody that has this, if you can get a picture and you can put it on the group, instructors will show up. We'll take a look at what you're doing and we'll try and help you out. We'll send you messages, <clears throat> make comments in, uh, in the group if you want. If you don't mind having commentary publicly, um, just let us know. Also, let us know if you're left when you do post those pictures, if you're left or right handed. Um, and that way, the you know, especially if you're lefty, the left handed instructors will find you much, much more quickly and get you much better instruction and, and help and make suggestions. Ian, this is Richard. If there is a need, I can make the Zoom channel available, schedule a meeting for practice sessions during the week. Okay. Uh, okay. So if people don't want to use, uh, you know, use this primarily for whatever, but if they wanted to have practice sessions, I could schedule that. That would not be a problem. All right. Well, that's a new one. So I'll have to talk with my other instructors about how we feel about that. Um, I like the idea. I really, really do. And I really appreciate the offer. All right. So back to drawing this letter. Uh, well, stroke. The hard part is figuring out how round to make it, how flat to make it. The easy part is you want to, and, the, and I say easy, easy, if I have a 30, pen, 30 degree pen angle here, if I draw an, a line here, it should be about 60. If I have a 45 degree pen angle, then this line that I draw from this tip to that tip should be about 45 degrees. And that the reason is, is that a four, you know, we have different, it changes the shape. So here I'm at a 30. And that's not the best 30 out there, so we'll redo it. Oh, come on. Yeah, let it resolve. See how that changes it? You get a fix in a slightly different place, you get your thins in a slightly different place. And so that changes where these are. Essentially, the idea being is that you want to stop so it doesn't look like you're leaning forward or that you're falling back too much. The second stroke that we do is the to the right. And it looks like that. And so if we do a curve to the left and a curve to the right, you make an O. That looks a little funny, doesn't it? Very flat here, kind of rounded there. And so you can actually practice both strokes, just making O's. So that's the curve to the left and the curve to the right. 
when you do this kind of practice, I really recommend that you don't do more than three to five in a row. Just keep it, you know, three to five. If you do more than that, you'll start to build the, the, the pathways in a way that makes the imperfect permanent. And if you do it three to five, you'll be like, okay, I see what I did. Switch to a different stroke, three to five, and then come back. If you find for some reason that your brain does not like that, and it's just like, it's too much skipping around. Okay, fine. Don't do that. But I recommend trying that at first. All right. So the next one that I want people to work on is the perpendicular stroke. Now I'm going to go above because I was dumb and put this in the middle and I can't really go lower without making it hard on everybody. So I'm going to come above it. And it really is move the pen back and forth a little bit so you can start the drink flow and then pull. You'll notice when I'm doing this, I am not doing that. This is my fingers doing it. I'm pulling with my arm. Should have said that at the beginning. Handwriting is done with the fingers. Calligraphy is done with locked finger, locked wrist. We pull with the elbow, we pull with the shoulder. And that will actually make things easier. Don't push too hard. Remember, act like you're pulling the ink out of the page. What does it look like when you don't have, when you're still learning your pen control? What's gonna happen is it's gonna want to slide in the direction that you're pulling in the way that your pen is pointed. So if I'm pointed at a 30, at a 45 degree angle, it's gonna slide at a 45. If it's at a 30, it's gonna slide at a 30. And so what ends up happening is that you kind of get into a tango with it and you pull and it goes that way. So you try and pull it straight and then it comes back there and you get there. Slightly exaggerated. I know I've made that stroke myself a few times when I was beginning. It tends to look a little bit more like this. A little bit more subtle. Or if you're anticipating it, You sometimes will do this. Uh oh, I'm off and come back and, and do something like that. The lighter your hand is, the less it's going to pull offline. So if you just put it down gently, get your ink flow going, act like you're pulling it out of the paper, touch and pull with your elbow, you'll get a much straighter line. Kind of like Bob Ross, happy trees, happy lines. Nice and gentle, pull down. And you have your perpendicular line. Now I've saved the hardest line for last. And that's the horizontal line. And the reason it's so hard is that it really wants to do that. And we're going to try and keep it horizontal to that baseline. Ian, we have a question. Yes, go ahead. What does it mean when only half the line, uh, parentheses nib width, is made in a downstroke? It means that your nib has not fully touched the paper. And that is very common. I should have discussed that. Thank you for bringing up the question. Um, thank, thank you, Judith. So um, what it means is, is that you are not used to writing with a flat tip nib. Usually, sometimes it means that you have a clog in your nib, but usually it means that uh, you're not writing flat. And so what you need to do with that, uh, so this is a, a right nib um, with a slant. I actually prefer flat ones, but they came with the slant, so I got to work with it. And that's one of the reasons why you'll see that happen. That is a stroke that tells you that your nib is not fully touching the, 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 your substrate, your, your paper in this case. Okay. And what I'm doing is I'm rotating my wrist. On it. If I do it to the right, 
Oh, I got my full nib down. But if I do it to the right, it's going to look a little bit more like that. So what I want to do is put it down, diagnose where the problem is, is it on the left side or the right side? And then I want to rotate my wrist and I can either do this and kind of work with a, what's called a broken wrist and that gets uncomfortable. Or if I'm like that and I'm drawing down and getting that, then I want to just rotate a little at the elbow. It doesn't take much. We're talking half a degree a degree and then try again. And that's what you'll get. Does that answer the question? Does that help people? It looks like it. There was a question whether the paper was straight or tilted, and I responded that it was straight. Let's see what we, well, we have a. I am working yes, on a yes. slant. Yes, Okay, so Judith yeah. said slant. Yes, yeah, she said yes. You answered the question. Excellent. I am working on a slant, so my paper is straight. If you yeah. are working flat, you will tend to find that if you're working at a 30 degree angle, turning your page to roughly a 60, allows you to do it. If you're working at a 45, you will find having your paper at a 45 is much more comfortable. When I do insular majuscule, which is a flat script, I work like this. I am completely perpendicular. When I write on a slant, I can have the page in front of me and I don't have any of those things. I don't have to redo it in my head or anything else like that. Um, which is why we recommend running on a, writing on a slant as much as you can. Now, is that the only way to do it? No. There are other ways. The other instructors, if you ask them, might have a slightly different answer for you. Eventually, uh, find what works for you. I am telling you the things that I have seen work for others that have worked for me. And if none of those work, that's not necessarily your problem. It's not that there's something wrong with you. It's that, well, let's find you a way that'll work for you. Just don't expect to get straight lines out of the bat. That's all I'm saying. Any other questions? All right. Yeah, we're at an hour and five minutes, so I apologize for going over. The horizontal lines, you can actually do one, two, three inside between the waistline and the baseline. Now you notice my first one, it bowed down. There's a dip in it. This is why we do warm-ups. And this, by the way, are the warm-ups that I do. It's to help me remind my body where it needs to be, get my corrections, and then and then sit down to actually write calligraphy. You know, it's just like if you're going to go work out, you should do some warm ups before you do your full workout. So, like I said, like I was starting to show at the beginning, it is very common for this to go up a little. That looks almost flat, but it's not. You'll also notice it's not as wide. That means that my pen nib was not flat on the paper. And this bowing happened because I pulled down so it wouldn't go up. That's a pretty common thing to see. I've been doing calligraphy for 16 years now. First stroke out of the bat, that's what I did. So, um, my, my, when I was first doing it, my, my instructor loved this one. I drew a wave. All right, I'll get it back online. Okay, I can relax. No, it got off. Okay, I'll get it back online. Should be, because I certainly am. It's just part of the game. It's part of what we do. 
the harder you push down, the more difficult your pen is to control. The more gentle you are, the easier your pen is to control. And like I said, horizontal lines are probably the hardest lines to draw. It took me nine strokes to get three that I thought are okay. So for homework, 15 minutes a day, curve to the left, curve to the right, perpendicular, horizontal. If you want to take the next step before next class of next, which is next week, where we're going to do Unshell, start trying to draw, draw your name. But, but use that as a way to practice your curve, your perpendicular, and your horizontals. Right. As for, unless there are more questions, that's going to be the end of the class. I'll wait and pause if there are, uh, if there are any questions at this point. No questions in the chat so far. Yep. Um, and if Jean, if you can take a picture of that and share that on the group, I can give you a better analysis. I cannot really get a good look at that from here. But we do have I a question. It. It looks like, yep. What do you use to oh, clean, clean up the cleaning ink? your dip pen? Right. Sorry. No, we can't in class. I have to teach you how to clean. Um, <laughs> I have a video for that, and I will share the uh, the link uh, in the group. Um, and I didn't bring my stuff with. I didn't bring it over. All right. So basically, get a toothbrush and water. And if you have liquid soap, use liquid soap. If you don't, use the mildest bar soap you have and, and brush your brush on it. By the way, do not use the toothbrush that you use to brush your teeth. Make this a dedicated one for cleaning your nibs. If you don't have any, if you have a dollar store nearby, they're cheap, you can usually get a bundle of them. Um, they don't need to be anything super fancy. Um, basic bristles are fine. The rubber things aren't gonna help any on this. So um, basic cheap toothbrush. Um, you get your toothbrush wet, you rinse this out. Oh wait, don't ever get your spring wet. So if you're gonna rinse this out, pull this out. If you have a detachable reservoir, detach it. If you don't, especially speedball nibs, don't come off. Let me grab a speedball for you. Here's a speedball nib that I didn't clean in time. And so um, it's permanently dark green. Um, do not lift this up and then put it back down. Lift it up, put it back down. It'll break. Metal fatigue is a thing. Um, that was the thing that I learned the hard way. It was kind of funny. So um, you take a breath. Imagine this tip is the brush. And you brush, 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 brush. Clean, 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 clean. Rinse it off. And then you want to take it sideways. And you want to force your bristles in underneath here. And brush, brush, brush. Flip it over so the, bristle, br brush, ah, <laughs> the bristles of your brush can go and brush, brush, brush. Rinse it off again. Um, at that point, dab it on a paper towel or something. Eh, you can. I really don't like telling people that, but you're right, you can. Um, and just until it comes clean. And then you take it a paper towel or and then you, you dab it on there. If color comes out, you, you need to do it again. Just do it again. It's all the same stuff. It's actually not horribly complicated, but if you haven't been shown how to do it, um, it, it doesn't make sense until you're like, oh, okay, yeah. So, and if it is a detached reservoir, these little buggers wash down the sink really easily. So uh, hold on to it carefully, maybe plug the sink. Um, I, I have lost, um, counting at 20 
uh, detached reservoirs. Uh, I just plug the sink if I'm going to clean the detached reservoir. Because if I don't, I will lose it sooner or later. Um, but that does make cleaning the nib itself a little easier. All you do is brush, 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 brush. And the bristles are going to get into the vent anyway, so you don't have to do anything special with it. Rinse it off. Once you have it going clear, dab it dry. Please do not air dry these. They will they can rust. Um, and if you haven't used your nibs before and you're still in the they're still brand new and you haven't used them, you're going to need to clean them anyway. Otherwise, the packing oil is going to make your you know drawing letters a real problem. It'll make the ink do funny things. Um, and yeah, I'll get, I have a blog post that I made about it, um, and I will get that on the group here in the next 15 minutes. Any All right, that looks like there aren't any new questions. If there's a question that you come up with, put it on the group, uh, PM me if you don't want to ask it publicly. I have no problem with that. So with that, let's go ahead and end the recording and